Hi YouTube, my name's Jeff and I'm the Veg Oil Guy. Today I'm going to be sharing a little Lost Firm casting with you. I'm going to be casting an aluminium wheel or aluminium to our American friends and I previously prepared the foam using techniques that I've already shared with you. Now traditionally, Lost Foam casting makes use of dry sand, but I prefer to use green sand. So let's start with that. Green sand needs to be prepared, and that's a true art form right there, and one that I don't pretend to have mastered yet, but it begins with sieving the sand to remove all debris and lumps. My sand is bone dry and needs to be moist, so perhaps every third or fourth sieve load, I spray the sand pile until I see the colour change, and then it's back to more sieving. Once I finish sieving, it's time to mix the sand and evenly distribute the moisture. You can see the different colours here, and that should show you that despite spraying as I was going, I never applied too much water, and that's key. From this point, it's just a matter of mixing and spraying repeatedly, until I'm happy with the overall moisture level of the sand. But what is that ideal moisture level? Well, as I say, I'm no expert, but here's the indicators I use. Notice my hand is fairly clean. The sand appears fairly dry and I can easily run my fingers through it and my hand is still clean. If sand sticks to it, it's too wet. I grab a handful of sand and squeeze it. It forms and holds a semi-solid shape. Now I gently try to break the shape and it should break cleanly. If it crumbles, the sand is too dry. So that's about as perfect as I can get the sand. Martin, our resident casting guru, tells me that it's better for sand to be too dry than too wet, so I'm leaving it there. Here's my homemade wooden flask. This is technically the drag, the bottom flask, to give it its proper name. But notice that mine has a solid bottom, which is unusual in green sand casting. But this isn't strictly green sand casting, it's lost foam casting. So I begin by loading up the bottom flask, packing it well and leveling it nice and flat. Whilst I'm talking about proper green sand casting, as well as our resident guru Martin, I'd also recommend looking at SW Dweeb's YouTube channel. Just like me, Dweeb doesn't claim to be a professional, but he's pulling out all the stops to develop his casting skills and he's doing a great job of it. So he's an excellent source of education, inspiration and entertainment. So check out his channel. When I think I've got everything packed down nicely, I sift some sand on top to try and give myself a nice fine finish. Then it's just a matter of packing it down some more and striking it off until it's nice and flat. Now I add the upper flask. Then the foam gets positioned fairly centrally. I begin by sifting on some more sand to completely cover the foam. The idea here is to get fine sand in contact with the foam, which provides a nice fine surface. Then I gently allow more sand to run through my fingers and fall onto the foam. Using just my fingertips, I gently push the sand around the foam, encouraging it to fill every nook and cranny, whilst being careful not to damage the foam pattern. There's a small hole here, so I'm using the blunt end of a drill bit to press the sand gently home. Then I start to push with my fingertips, again quite gently. The trick is to squeeze the sand up against the foam without dislodging it and especially without damaging it. Green sand compresses really well, but don't be tempted to overdo the pressure. Follow the contours of the pattern around the circumference, between the spokes, in the center, and press the sand, feeling it give and bind. Here I'm using the handle of a rubber mallet to ram the sand, but notice that I'm not going mad. You can apply too much pressure and bind the sand too tightly, something that needs to be avoided. So just tap at this stage and notice the movement of the sand. I'm aiming now to draw level with the tips of the gates. Using a dry brush, I clean all the sand from the tops of the gates and use my fingertips to create a little more room. 
then it's time to remove the screws. And because of the way I've prepared the foam, I know I've got a central core of air inside my pattern. My theory is this benefits the bore, enabling easier metal flow and release of gases. Now this is a plaster feeder and for the moment it has a paper cover on its top to prevent any sand from getting in. It fits perfectly on the foam gate with just a gentle push. This is a plaster vent, again it has a temporary paper cover on top. I carefully trowel in more sand to avoid disturbing the feeder and vent and this gets compressed into place, firstly with my fingers and then with a mallet handle. I'm convinced these plaster feeders and vents greatly improve my casting technique. They help me get the metal where I want it, keep it hotter longer and vent any unwanted gases. More sand is added and compressed, all the time looking to support the feeder and vent. Eventually I strike off the sand and brush away any loose excess. Now this is a fine metal rod, it's actually a bicycle spoke. I carefully judge the depth to make sure I don't get within an inch of the foam and then it's a matter of poking random holes into the sand. And why am I doing this? Well it's a tip from Martin that you may have seen me using in another video roughly a year ago and one that I think he's used himself in his latest video. As I said earlier, compressing the sand too much is dangerous. As the foam evaporates and even as the metal consolidates, gases are released. These typically escape through the sand, but if the sand is too compressed, they can't pass through it and instead can dangerously build up and literally explode, something that needs to be avoided when you're dealing with molten metal. The plaster feeder and vent go a long way to prevent this, but these holes provide an extra source of ventilation and they really work, as you'll see for yourself in a moment. I've had my homemade electric foundry running at 760 degrees and the metal is ready to pour. The paper covers are removed and then the red hot crucible is carefully tilted towards the wide mouth feeder. Now I know this is dragging on a bit, but keep watching that feeder. Can you see it? The metal is still red hot. There, it's actually still bubbling. It's still red hot metal. I told you the plaster feeders kept it hotter for longer. Did you notice the smoke from the spoke holes? Surprising isn't it? Remember these holes never contacted the foam but they were close enough for gases to find and use them. I left things a good hour then took the flasks apart. And look at that, beautifully discoloured sand, and that's a good thing. It shows evidence of heat, smoke and gases escaping into the sand, just as they should. That's why green sand blackens over time. Looking at the wheel inside the sand, I was pleased. Sure it had surface discoloration due to the decomposition processes, but this could easily be cleaned up. Here it is half an hour later with the sand removed. It's nicely formed, good crisp edges and almost ready to go. Everything is beautifully straight and flat. It may look rough and sure the texture of the foam is evident, but it's just discoloration. Once the surface is lightly cleaned, these will disappear and the proof of the process will be revealed. 
If there are any imperfections, they will have been present on the foam pattern before casting. And here it is with the sprues removed and the surfaces cleaned up a little. I think you'll agree it looks quite nice. I tend to put a lot of effort into preparing the foam and then very little energy needs to be put into the metalwork side. I've already heard from some of you guys saying that you prefer to do things the other way around and that's okay, that's your personal choice. Personally I find it easier and much faster to put a little effort into the foam rather than a lot of effort into grinding, cutting and shaping metal. But whatever your preference, I hope you can see how useful this green sand can be in lost foam casting. I find it very reliable and I get consistent results and for me that's the way it should be. Next time I'll be experimenting with dry sand and a thin plaster coating on the foam so look out for that video. Whee! So I think we can call that a finished video. I hope you enjoyed this one guys and if you did please like it. If you've got any questions on the subject please drop me a line. Don't forget to check out my website and please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Look out for my other videos on my YouTube channel and send in any comments and video requests. So that's it for now guys. Thanks for watching.